Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm gonna go back and shut the door after this. Uh, so I wanted to come up and introduce the uh, education panel we're having this afternoon. We have a couple of really interesting projects that these guys have been working on. And so um, first we have from 315, thanks. 315 to 345, we have Darren Milligan here, who's from the Center for Learning and Digital Access at the Smithsonian. And he's gonna be talking about um, how they uh, just recently rolled out a new project for the Digital Learning Lab. Uh, I think I said that name wrong. Yes? No? Learning Lab. Smithsonian Learning Lab. Learning Lab. Okay. So you're going to do that first. Yeah. Then we're going to move on to Shauna Crossan and Craig, Dr. Craig Robley. And um, they are going to talk about uh, how they lost their email connection and can't pull up the, sen the description uh, about collaborative project with Medical Minnesota Historical Society. Okay, great. So uh, we encourage you to tweet using the MCN hashtag MCN2015 or you can send me a message and uh, I will ask the questions as we wrap up. So uh, here we go. I was on just the Hyatt Wi-Fi earlier. It was actually working a lot better. Hyatt yeah. So hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, sort of introduce a project today. Um, the URL there uh, is up there, learninglab.si.edu. is the Twitter handle also, um, which is a, a brand new baby Twitter handle. Um, but uh, to do that, I wanted to give a little bit of background to the project. But since this is our sort of education panel this afternoon, I thought we would start with a pop quiz. Naughty teacher. It's, a, it's an easy quiz, though. It's only one question. It's multiple choice. And the question is, you know, which of these statements will be, be four uh, options here? Um, as an indicator of success, best characterizes the preferred emotional state of museum users following some interaction with, with our resources, whether our museums, our exhibitions, our expertise, our collections. So the first answer, uh, the first option, is this object is amazing. Um, B, scaling up a bit, this exhibition is amazing. C, this museum is amazing. And the final answer, this this brand is amazing. So again, the question, which of those statements are, are sort of the ideal emotional state, the thing that we want our users to feel after they have come in contact with, 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 uh, with us? Um, so the four answers there. So if everyone has an answer, I won't make you do a show of hands, but uh, um, it's a bit of a, uh, a trick question. Um, there's actually a fifth answer. Um, and I think it's the right answer. Um, and that's, I am amazing. So it's really not about our collections or our exhibitions or our resources, um, nor about how, how users or our visitors feel about us. It's about how they feel about themselves. Um, and the project I'm going to talk about is really about thinking about how, how we, um, we as museums or we as the Smithsonian can make teachers uh, amazing in the work that they do. Um, so there's really two realities I want to sort of start with um, about uh, kind of uh, teachers in, in the world today. Um, the first is that teachers are, are, are deep users of digital resources. And so when I mean, when I mean teachers, um, I mean a lot of people. So in the U.S. there's about three and a half million teachers. Um, globally there's maybe 27, 28 million teachers. There's a lot of people out there who are engaged formally in, in teaching. Um, and they are using a lot of digital content in their work. So this is all from a, a, a Pew study from a couple years ago that looked at about 2,500 middle and high school teachers. Um, you know, these are really high numbers. They're all using the internet. They're all using digital resources to both find content for their students and to help them create their own lessons. So those percentages here just in, in millions, there are millions of people who are using the, using the internet um, uh, um, continually um, to, to impact, uh, impact learning. Uh, the second reality is that teachers are not only users of digital resources, but they're also makers of digital resources. Um, these again from that same Pew study, um, you know, 51% of teachers are taking material they find online, songs, text, images, and remixing 
remixing that into their own creation. Um, that, those numbers may not seem very high, but the, that same Pew study looked at um, adult internet users uh, in the US. So that 51% of teachers compared to just regular adults is 17%. So this, this group of individuals are extremely high users of digital content, um, extremely high remixers um, and creators of digital resources. So again, those numbers. So we've got millions of people out there who are using our resources probably in ways um, s ways that, that we would probably be kind of happy about, you know, ways that, that make them successful. So the, the problem that, um, that this project, um, I guess, was developed to, to address um, was fairly complex. I mean, one was these evolving realities of the classroom. And so museums were, um, in, in the museums that I, that I work with, um, we're, we're no longer dealing in a space where field trips and lesson plans were necessarily fulfilling or, or meeting the, the need of, of teachers. Um, and at a place like the Smithsonian, there's a big problem with a sort of a fragmented brand. And so, you know, you may think of the Smithsonian as this, this kind of one big place. And I think, you know, those of us who sort of work in Washington who walk along the National Mall and engage with um, tourists, and sort of looking at John, are often asked, hey, where's the Smithsonian? Which building is the Smithsonian? There's this kind of idea that it's this one big kind of entity. And it's, you know, really more like this. I mean, you know, the Smithsonian has 19 museums. Um, it's actually more like this. There's nine major research centers across the world. There's lots of programmatic offices, like the, the one that I work for, which is this guy, um, the Center for Learning and Digital Access. Really small group at the center whose focus is really on ensuring that the digital resources that, that come from across the Smithsonian, from all those museums and research centers, are highly discoverable and really useful for, for learning. Um, the next you know, problem is this idea of an outdated platform. And so in, in 2003, the office I worked for launched smithsonianeducation.org. And it was a, kind of really one of the first attempts at, at scale to present the Smithsonian to, to teachers. And so it was a, really a platform um, whose, whose major feature was a search engine. You know, there's about 2,000 educational resources on, on this site from all these museums and research centers. And it was really an attempt to, to help teachers use or discover the Smithsonian. But it was built in 2003. Um, this is another site from 2003. Um, the, the number three top seller there is uh, a Harry Potter VHS cassette. <laughs> so, you know, I, mean, I don't know, 2003 doesn't seem like that long ago to me, but you know, in, in terms of the web, it's a really long time. I mean, Amazon looks like this now, kind of an unrecognizable experience to, to people, you know, back in, in 2003. Um, search looked like this in 2003. Um, you know, Alta Vista. Um, you know, this really all kind of predates kind of the social web. Um, and so we were, you know, working with an infrastructure and, and offering an experience to teachers that no longer met with the, the expectations of really, you know, just people using the web who, who have new expectations. Simultaneously since that time, the Smithsonian's been digitizing collections in a pretty, pretty, um, pretty um, substantial way. So collection objects and scientific illustrations, videos, artworks, um, uh, printed material, all of this was sort of emerging but not really being offered to teachers in a way that made sense to how they might use this material. And the biggest problem for us is we really didn't have much data. Um, we really, we wanted to begin operating in a very audience-driven way. We really wanted to understand teachers and their, their way that they might interact with our content. But we really didn't have data about who they were, how they were using our material, and really how they might prefer to do that. Um, much less, really, were students learning from the resources that we were producing and, and putting out there into the world. And so the, the solution for us was, was research. Um, so we started about five years ago, really, with the idea of how do we rebuild SmithsonianEducation.org, how do we build a new website that makes sense for teachers. Um, but step back and I think ask a bigger question, like what does a place like the Smithsonian um, do to support teaching in the classroom? How, how does a place with diverse resources, with um, incredible resources, um, really match that, those expectations? And how, how can we define what those expectations are? So we, we conducted a series of five research projects, um, research and evaluation projects over the past five years to look specifically at the resources themselves and the platforms on which they were offered. And as so we sort of did a kind of a meta-analysis of that, looking at a lot of literature that's, that's um, been published by others doing similar work, we, we kind of came to conclusions in these sort of four areas. Um, 
The first is really, you know, search preferences and, you know, enabling effective search for educators, you know, reflects just enabling good search for, for human beings. Um, you know, they, they're, teachers are, are, are people. They like good search interfaces. Um, but they do have specific needs. I mean, they're, 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 uh, there's things that are more important to them, um, things like grade level and subject information. Um, information that, that makes a scanning a resource possible for them to under to help them understand if it's really um, accessible to you know for for their need. They like things from lots of sources. They really they don't really care that you're an important place. They want the thing that makes sense for their students. Um, there's things that we're doing that are uh, making their jobs more difficult. Um, one is we have a lot of stuff. We have a lot, a lot and a lot of things, and that makes it really difficult when we don't describe or offer search interfaces that, that make sense. Um, and we typically describe our resources, especially collection resources, in, way that make, in ways that make sense to us, um, not in ways that make sense to, to, to them and, and much less to their students. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, learning resources, they um, you know are pretty consistent with the needs when explaining the types of sort of digitally accessible resources that they're looking for from museums. Um, they're looking for things that are interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Really important they connect to student interests. Really important that they're uh, aligned to standards. Um, they also need to be really adaptable, and this means a couple of things. So it means how they're used pedagogically. So. Can, can a resource make sense for, for students in a classroom that may have varying learning styles, reading styles, reading abilities, but is also functionally adaptable? So can it be flexible for presentation, for sharing, for, for printing, for sending home? Can, it, can a resource meet a lot of those needs? And finally, for the platform, the platform on which they discover, discover these materials, um, really important that, that there's material there not just from one provider. Um, again, they 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 don't really care um, who produced the content as long as it makes sense for their students. Lots of ways to share, lots of ways to save and structure information to come back later and, and, and look at it and digest it and make sense of it at another time. Um, so we worked through this, this kind of research and tried to understand what this might mean and, and turned that, in a sense, into a series of functional requirements for a project um, that ended up uh, being called uh, the, the Learning Lab. And you know, while the lab itself was designed kind of out of these out of these research projects and designed for teachers and students, it, it really you know was intentionally designed to be used by anyone, anyone who really wants to explore their own interests through collections, through the sort of the, the Smithsonian collections and, and resources. And so that that means what's there are these thousands of educational resources, but also collection objects and and videos and uh, publications. And really, more importantly, it provides tools for. Um, for users to create their own collections, sort of pulling together resources from the Smithsonian, contributing content from, from their own world, um, and then share what they've made with others. And so I'm going to kind of walk through that experience to give you a, a flavor of, of what, that, uh, what that looks like. Um, and I should say we launched eight days ago, so um, <laughs> thank you. I only say that if you go to the site, there's lots of things that are, you know, in soft launch stage. We're really working on uh, working on getting things right, but we we uh, we were very excited to to get this project uh, up. We've been sort of actively developing it for about the past 12 months. Um, the the experience of Learning Lab is really around these three ideas of discovery, creation, and sharing. And these are sort of three instances of of the homepage. Um, when we start with discovery, you know, it's really about the improving the way that that people can find the resources that we have available. Um, if you've used the Smithsonian Collection Search Center before, um, if you've used some of our sites, you you see there's a wide variety of sort of quality of of discovery. Um, this is an attempt to improve to improve that. Um, and what you're discovering, so the Smithsonian Collections look like this. Um, 138 million objects and specimens, 2 million library volumes, 153,000 cubic feet of archival material. We will never, ever digitize that. Um, and we don't want to. Um, we actually only plan to digitize a small portion of uh, the collections. The first one seems really small, but it's mostly there because about 92% of um, the, the collections are actually specimens held in the Natural History Museum. So there's a very small percentage of that that makes sense to digitize in a, in a substantial way. So really only about 9% of the total objects will ever be digitized. 
quite a, quite a bit more of the library volumes and the archival material. Um, so the numbers still are pretty en enormous. This would, once this project is, is sort of completed, there'll be about 13 and a half million digital objects, um, about 80,000 cubic feet of archival material digitally available. That's not there today. What's there today um, is a little bit smaller, but still really big. Um, so there's about 1 in 1.3 million resources. That's uh, 1 and a quarter million images, 34,000 text-based resources, 11,000 videos and audio files, about 2,000 lesson plans and other learning resources. Um, in, our, in, our, in our week of being live, we've had about almost 50 um, user or institutionally generated collections. Um, I'll show you what, what a collection looks like. Um, but we've had about 250 total collections that are in the works, so um, people are starting to use it. Um, the discovery experience is very visual. Um, this might be if you're looking for a, a specific uh, species um, here. Um, once you find a resource you're interested in exploring, um, ideally if the, if the resource is available in high resolution, you get some extremely great experiences. Um, lots of views of the same object. You might also look for uh, an art resource or a strange art resource. Um, this is a, a 19th century woodblock print from the Fern Sackler Gallery. Each of the resources pulls in the full collection record, so all the, all the information that came from the museum, from the curatorial side, is, is maintained and presented alongside the object. Um, zoom tools so you can get in close with this insane dog <laughs> that sort of mesmerizes me. Um, and you also discover collections, and so those, those almost 50 collections um, that I mentioned um, are searchable. Um, a collection is really just an aggregation of these resources that, um, uh, that looks something like this. Collections have metadata as well, so this is metadata that the collection creator, Kate Harris, who's a, 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 an educator in Pittsburgh, uh, made this collection. And she inputted all of this metadata to describe her collection. So, um, she indicated the subjects, the age levels, um, indicated the, the instructional strategies, the end user. Um, she aligned it to Common Core English Language Arts Standards. I'll show you how that's done here in a minute. And ultimately, really, the, the goal on our end is to get people creating using these resources. The idea is how do you, you know, how do we inspire uh, more of that work? And you know, creating in, in Learning Lab takes the form of creating a collection. Um, and a collection can be, you know, my collections look sort of like this. They're just, you know, really interesting, amazing things that I've found that have some sort of theme. Things that probably have never been aggregated before in, in any um, substantial way, but sort of begin to take on a, a new idea or a new way of seeing things uh, once pulled together. Educators, though, probably make collections that look a little bit more like this. So this is a very structured learning uh, activity that's designed to be assigned directly to students uh, right within the system. Um, this was, again, made by Kate, um, who's, who's an educator that we know. Um, each of the individual resources uh, in the Learning Lab look very similar in the way that others find them. But what Kate's done here is you can sort of see these icons on the left. She's made this resource a lot more accessible to her students. She's done that by describing it. She's added annotations on the left. Um, here she's described what this object is. Um, she says, you know, use the highlights on the image to investigate some of the details. So what, what Learning Labs allowed her to do is to highlight sections um, of, of the, the object. Notice the portraits on the wall. Who are these men pictured? Why might they be chosen? She's had a, another one to indicate text that's on the image that she wants to ensure her students see. And she's put a quiz, two quiz questions, at this stage in the learning resource. So she's layered on some opportunity for um, to check to ensure that her students are at, at the level to begin to, to move on. Those questions can also be layered in independently, um, so not necessarily associated with a resource. That's sort of what you're seeing here. Some of these kind of text box or question boxes or, or progressions are sort of checks for understanding as, as she moves through. Kate also can add content that she didn't find in the learning lab. So actually, that that Thomas Nass we were looking at is actually an object from the Library of Congress. It's not a Smithsonian object at all. She found it on the site. Library of Congress has really fantastic usage um, uh, rights, and she, she downloaded that images and, and uploaded it to Learning Lab and used it to augment the collections of the Smithsonian to sort of tell the story and to create the learning opportunity that she, she was interested in creating. 
So she could do that via uploading an object. She can pull in something via a URL. Um, and she can begin to see what happens with her work. So this is a um, kind of where we're working towards on, on a dashboard. And what's kind of exciting, I think, for Kate, and what's really going to be exciting for us, is this piece on the right. So you can see um, under sort of my public collections here, um, this user has made 44 collections. They've been viewed over 3,000 times, and they've been modified 12 times. So this user can begin to see how, as they create collections and others begin to find them and use them, how that changes and how they begin to modify, which is something, you know, as we create collections as an institution, you know, and we create resources, we, we were never able to do. We'd, we'd create lesson plans, and they'd be downloaded or mailed out, and they sort of disappeared to us, that kind of train of, of what happened to them. What types of students were they put in front of? What, what were the activities that other teachers had created alongside of them? That, that was sort of a dead end. You know, without an expensive evaluation project, it was almost impossible to, 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 find, to find that data. Um, but we and all, all users on LearningLab will be able to sort of see that. And ultimately, um, we want our users to, to share. Um, and so sharing within the system can just mean publishing. So you can create a collection and use it privately, kind of an unlisted model. Um, but we're hoping that people actually share them back into the system. And when they do that, um, they're asked like that to generate that metadata that we saw before. So describing it, um, adding appropriate subject alignments, age levels, uh, educational features like language, end user, um, educational use. And aligning to standards, um, we've got uh, math and English language common core and next-gen science built in um, right now. Sharing also means social sharing, so lots of opportunities to, to, to get our resources and our collections sort of out into the world, you know, on Facebook and Pinterest and, and Twitter. And sharing also means assigning. So um, Kate, our sort of Thanksgiving collection teacher, can assign a resource to a group of students right within the system. The students have their own accounts. They respond to quiz questions. They can engage in group discussions right within the system. Um, so there's uh, opportunities there to really use this in a really formal, uh, really formal way. So we have a lot of next steps because we've just launched. Um, we're sort of working towards a more big public launch uh, in February at the TCEA conference. We'll do a press release, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, we're working with uh, uh, the Grable Foundation in Pittsburgh right now to really try to understand how do teachers begin to use a system like this. Um, we've, as we've begun, we've begun using this sort of in prototype stage, we, we realize this isn't a lesson plan builder. This is something kind of different. And we realize teachers probably need a lot of supports to, to begin to work in this way or to make use of, of resources in this way. So we've got a really extensive project there to try to figure that out. Um, we also have a, a partnership with UC Irvine to look at how users use this, this type of material so we can really understand, you know, does a, does a, does a teacher user versus a non-teacher user use content or different types of content in, in different ways. So it's really uh, a way that we're going to be able to evolve this. Um, and then ultimately, it's, you know, we, we really struggled, um, I'm sort of looking, Joe, who's our developer, uh, is in the room here from Navigation North. We had, you know, conversations at the beginning about who our core audience really was, and it was really a struggle. I mean, I think we had to eventually, like, have, like, a, like a you know, like a ballot, like a, you know, because we, we struggled really internally about who we had to focus on, and, and ultimately it was teachers that we, that we focused on, but, but the kinds of people in this room are really important to this project, museum educators and technologists and, and folks that, that we aspire to enable to use a system like this to do their work. Um, and so I hope that you will consider checking it out, um, searching for something that you, that you care about, um, something that you're interested in. Um, make a collection, share it out, and then you know, share with me sort of what, uh, you, know, what you found, what's, what's not working, what is working, um, what you'd like this to, to be. Um, so I think I'm out of time. I've got one final thought. And uh, thank you. Um, quick question regarding, so you can create collections on the site. Is there an API that 
uh, could expose that for yeah. application developers so that other museums uh, might be able to use the data and the, uh, the content in their own mm -hmm. exhibits? So we, we have that on our roadmap. Um, we don't have it on our roadmap for external, sort of outside of Smithsonian use. Um, there's a lot of sort of political and legal reasons for that. Um, it's something that a lot of us internally are working to, to change. Um, we've seen, Joe and I were talking some kind of amazing technologies this week and things that, that a project like this could really build upon if, if the Smithsonian would become more comfortable with its metadata and its images flowing outward uh, in a way that makes sense to the world. Um, so, yes, but keep your fingers crossed for us. I have a related question and then an unrelated question. Are you going to include all of the Smithsonian affiliate museums uh, and their collections in this? Mm -hmm. Another thing we've thought about, yeah. Um, maybe. Most of the affiliated museums probably aren't in a place technologically to for us to easily in ingest their metadata. Um, that doesn't mean it's not possible. It's more, I would say, it's probably it's more of a political um, question. I mean, many of the things aren't in here, the digital assets of the, the Smithsonian museums aren't in, in here because they're not collection objects. And so we have amazing photography that's on Flickr. N none of that's here because this is built off of some existing collection management system technology. Mm -hmm. And there's some ambiguity about what belongs in a system like that. Um, and so Certainly, museums that are not Smithsonian museums, how would they belong in a system like this? So there's a lot of kind of questions like that that I think internally people are sort of kind of beginning to think about. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've talked to folks at, you know, our friends at Library of Congress and National Archives that have, you know, incredibly complementary content that makes sense in a system like this, especially one designed to really pull together almost anything into a way that makes sense. And um, so it's something we're talking about, yeah. My second question, very really quickly, is um, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Can can the teachers save it in some other form, or is it just on your site? And if it is just on your site, when you tested, did you find any pushback from educators around that? Yeah. So we have, um, or we're working to get implemented, just sort of a download button just for images. Um, collections are a little bit more difficult um, because, you know, they're designed to be interactive in a sense. I mean, there's quizzes and discussion boards, and those things are hard to pull into a, a downloadable format or a printable format. Um, we've talked about it a bit. It's something that's not there now, um, primarily because of the, the sort of ambiguity about how, how do you turn a, a classroom-based discussion board into something else, into another format. and so. Um, it's something we're thinking about. It's, I think it's something we're going to hear a lot as, as a lot more teachers come in here. And it's certainly something that came out of the research, this idea of being able to sort of download something and, and sort of use it in a different format. So it's not there now, though. Yeah. Are there any concerns with um, uh, privacy, student privacy, yeah. if they're using the system? Yeah, definitely. So part of what we've been working on the past year um, fortunately, we were able to um, work with the Berkman Center at Harvard to, um, they have a cyber law clinic, kind of assigned a couple of their law students to us for, for the past year to help us, you know, work through the appropriate COPA and FERPA compliance standards. So um, we do have user accounts here for kids 12 and under. Um, they're extremely sheltered, limited in, in terms of what they can do and what they're exposed to. Um, we're working on, the FTC has some um, organizations they've designated as safe harbors, meaning that these organizations can sort of designate um, a kind of a seal of approval um, that, that sites comply with that. The, the Smithsonian doesn't necessarily have to legally comply with COPA, um, but we, we, you know, our general counsel's opinion is that we should. Um, and so the site is, is uh, compliant as, as best as we can tell. But it's been a big concern because, you know, we. The, the easiest answer is to say, well, 13 and under don't have accounts here. And, you know, most of our, historically, most of our learning resources are developed for middle school, kind of middle and early high. So you're, you're going to lose, you're going to lose that, you know, if you, if you drop kids that young. So, um, but yeah. I 
just wanted to ask a little bit more about how you conducted the research, how many teachers you um, got feedback from sure. uh, versus how many requests you sent out and what kinds of questions you asked them. Sure. So it's a, I guess, a multi-part answer because it was a series of studies. The, the bulk, um, the, I would say the bulk prototyping stage of the process, which happened uh, in 2013, um, started with some small focus groups of teachers in California um, that were already users of Smithsonian Digital Resources who sort of agreed to sort of talk to us about how they discover and use that content. Go back to the classroom and use it, meaning rip it apart and combine it with resources from other places and then sort of come back and, and walk us through what that process looked like. So we took that sort of concrete experience with a lot of the literature and the sort of results of the studies that had been done before and, and, and started with some, some paper prototyping that led to the development of a full digital prototype. That was done with about 100 teachers um, that were coming to Washington for a sort of a teacher professional development workshop and we were able to sort of carve out time each day and Joe and team were there with their developers so that teachers could give us sort of feedback and see the results of their feedback the next day. So we were sort of iteratively prototyping every day. And so we kind of ended, ended the, that experience with sort of you know, vision version 15 of a prototype, um, a digital prototype that enabled us then to move on. So this past year, though, we've had a group of about 30 or 40 teachers from across the country who have been sort of our go-to user group that we've sort of pinged back and forth throughout the years. We've developed things you know, for all manner of questions about what should we call a collection? Should it be a set or a collection or a, you know, there's all kinds of things like that. So, um, and then, you know, we've got this group in Pittsburgh that's kind of our, gonna be our core users for the, f at least the, the sort of soft launch stays, stage. So we're kind of not, we have lots of big networks of teachers that we interact with, um, but we're kind of holding back until, until February to, till we sort of make the bigger splash. We're going to do one more question, and then um, if you have any questions, Darren will be available yeah. after the session um, to speak with you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, y it looks like you've made some pretty bold design choices. It doesn't look like a government site, and it looks like it might sort of be f pretty futured forward. Did you find like that matched up with usability and um, especially teacher usability? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, it's. Um, I'd say it. it, it it feels like a risk to us. I mean, you know, none of us wanted to make a site that looked like a government website. You know, I mean, I, I think we, we had a conversation when we first moved into this design, which was fairly recent. Actually, we had kind of a previous design and group we were working with that we sort of moved away from and, and found a, a different group that was matching the, the, the feel of this, which was, is very much intended to feel like a, like a piece of software, like a tool and not a website. Um, but we had that conversation, is this, is this too sophisticated for teachers? And we, you know, we, we kind of were in the middle of this conversation. It was like, God, what are we saying? Like, we shouldn't build something that feels contemporary for a group that typically or often gets things that have yellow school buses on them. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that, you know, I mean, the, there's a balance, though, between things that feel comfortable to the audience you're trying to reach, um, sort of not to sort of rip on you know, yellow school buses. We have a lot of things that look like that too that, that are easier to, to sort of identify with. Um, part of this design though is, is to, to ensure that people who aren't teachers feel like it's a tool for them. Um, you know, I mean, our previous work was really about teachers and you know, this is coming right out of mostly teacher, um, you know, um, evaluation and research. But as we started working through this, we kind of realized like, you know, this is probably something lots of people are gonna wanna use. Uh, for, for ways, ideally, that we, we can't imagine. Um, and, and so the, the, the kind of simplicity of the design really um, is, an, is an intentional in that way. So thanks for that question. Well, thank you, Darren. Yeah. While I'm getting this set up, I want to just say um, I'm so excited <coughs> about their learning lab. Um, I first learned about this, Darren's work and what he was doing three years ago at MCN um, and have been 
bothering him and harassing him fairly regularly since then. <laughs> He's not going to disagree <laughs> about, where, no, about where they're at and what they're doing. Um, I, uh, my name is Shauna Crossan. I'm an education technologist. I work at the Minnesota Historical Society, and we'll see if this is going to work. Um, I'm presenting today with Craig Robley, who's an eighth grade uh, American history teacher at Heritage. Heritage STEM <laughs> Middle School. I've said that how many times, I've been blanking. I'm in West St. Paul. Um, Craig and I have done a tremendous amount of collaboration on digital primary sources, and um, so it's really fun to present with Darren on this because this is something that Craig and I work on all the time. Um, obviously, I don't have the resources that Darren does, so I'm very grateful that he has done all of that research for me. So I can just uh, go on to, is that still on up all your, your wiki with all your research? Um, if you're interested, ping Darren and get the wiki because it's just a, a treasure trove of research information um, if you're doing work in digital primary sources. Um, <clears throat> so once, uh, oh, and about the Learning Lab, I am just, I'm so excited. I do a ton of work training teachers, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and I have a session on Monday, and I've already asked Darren if it's okay if I tried out the Learning Lab on Monday, and we're going to do a little exercise um, training, showing teachers how to use that, and I'm really excited to see what they say. Um, <clears throat> once I found out I was presenting with Darren, <laughs> I decided to change the track of this a little bit. Um, and I'm going to talk primarily about things that um, Craig and I have done together. Um, so we'll kind of go through some of that. Um, Craig and I first started collaborating a number of years ago um, at a re research session where I had the luxury of having 10 teachers. I didn't have 100, but I had 10. Uh, for a week, 10 very seasoned, experienced teachers working with digital primary sources and primary sources. Um, and we spent a week really talking about how teachers use primary sources, what they do, how they find them. Um, these were power teachers, power user teachers. Um, Craig is one of them, and he's going to let him talk and share his magic in a minute. Um, so I'm just going to go through some quick things that we learned from that. Uh, this was just one thing that I found was fascinating. Um, all grade level teachers use primary sources, digital primary sources, and this was just something that we observed talking to teachers. At, uh, the teachers we had ranged from a first grade teacher up through high school, school teachers. Um, so this I thought was just kind of interesting where they tend to be. This is a, yes, this is an event-based object. It is a duster, the Jesse James duster. It's pretty exciting for us Minnesota people. Um, Darren mentioned this, uh, and this is something we see all the time. Teachers are overwhelmed by the amount of stuff we have, overwhelmed, and especially once you get students in there. Um, a lot of teachers don't even want to send their eighth graders out looking at our stuff because they can't, students don't have those research skills. And honestly, Craig does, but there are a lot of teachers who don't have those research skills either. Um, so one of the things we get a lot of um, requests for Um, is that they want, and this just, it, it, it bothered me at first, but I'm, I'm fine with it now. They want us to do the first pass, to gather some resources, to pull maybe 20 or 30 objects together, let them have access to those, and then they'll pick from those instead of having to deal with 1,300 things that deal with the Civil War. They're like, give me 30, and then I'll deal with that. So one of the things we're doing with that, um, yes, these are print packets. It's okay. Um, we started with print. We're doing digital as well, where we are pulling some of those resources together so that teachers have just a small set to start with, and then they can expand further. Um, another, and Darren touched on this too, but teachers really don't care about a lot of the information that museums tend to care about. They don't care about nomenclature. It just gets in the way. And so teacher, the teachers we worked with were very clear that they wanted a wrapper, a context, an information but not the information that we tend to care about. It was, they want the stories and the historical context. So that's one of the things we're able to do in these print pieces and in the digital pieces that are coming. Um, this one, I think, is just a, this was a fascinating piece to me. Teachers pick things for different reasons than museums do, obviously. Um, we showed this first picture, and the teachers were like, ick. They hated that picture. They didn't like it. They wouldn't use it. And they wanted this one instead. And there really was, there was so much more in that image. And it was fantastic. I have about a 15 minute diatribe of why that image on audio, why that image, that top one, they wouldn't use it, and why this one was better. Mm -hmm. So again, when we're choosing images or objects, digital primary sources, we need to think of why and what the teachers are using them for instead of just what we think they're for. Um, so, this was that research session. Since then, Craig and I have done a number of training sessions with teachers about uh, digital primary sources, finding them and using them. And one thing we've observed is there are power users, and there are a lot of teachers 
who are really excited about using primary sources, but really don't have the skills yet and don't know how to. Um, every time I go to do a training session, and usually I present at education conferences, as a matter of fact, Craig and I will be presenting here in a month in this hotel, mm -hmm. another session for teachers how to use primary sources, digital primary sources, and it, I always feel like, oh, what I'm gonna say, they already know. Inevitably, it's really, um, we're really helping teachers learn how to do this, this work. Um, it's really exciting. So one of the things we do is really teach teachers where to find, help teachers find reliable primary sources. Um, so I have a Pinterest board that teachers can find places that are good sources. If any of you want me to add your museum to it, let me know, and I'll put you on my Pinterest board. Um, we talk about using local sources. Local primary sources are, can be more accessible. It helps students relate to their, and Craig's going to talk about this, um, to their community, but it also tells bigger picture, bigger picture stories. Um, we talk about using visual sources, not just text. Teachers, and again, I'm vastly overgeneralizing, but the, Craig and I find this when we talk to teachers is they tend to focus on text-based resources. Um, and we really are encouraging them to start looking more broadly at visual resources and making those accessible and findable. Um, one thing I do, to, and I'll do this on Monday when I'm teaching, really the basic primary source analysis. What are the basic things you do with students, and Craig's going to talk about this too, um, to get students to interact with these primary sources. And it's, you know, as basic as what do you see, what do you think you know, what do you want to know? To do some writing prompts. Just and then I do a lot of suggestions with teachers of what they can do with primary sources in their classroom. Do writing prompts, ideas. I love this one, do thought bubbles. Create stories and tell stories with these primary sources. What are these guys all thinking? Why are they in the park? What do you know about this? What do you think is going on in their heads? Um, digital storytelling is a really awesome thing to do with students. I also talk a lot about tools and technology tools that teachers can use with their students. ThingLink is a great one. Um, how many of you have used ThingLink? Excellent, those of you who haven't, take a look at it. Um, it's a great tool, I'll be teaching that one again on Monday. For teachers to really interact with students and add context and different layers to the primary sources, just creating a digital timeline is a great tool. There's a number of these tools out there. This is a great activity. Another one I've recently discovered is the ArcGIS story maps. Um, these are a little more complex to create, but there's a number of them online to use to teach from. This is just one, um, and I'm just gonna put this up here as another, a list of a, different, a number of different things that I uh, put out for teachers to take a look at. Using basic tools like Pinterest, if, if it's not blocked in a school, as a way to curate objects and pull things together. Although now I might send them all to the learning lab instead. <laughs> so um, again, I'm just running through some of these things that I do with teachers to get them excited about using primary sources um, and get the teachers on them, get their students to access primary sources and learn from them. Um, I'm going to let Craig talk now. Craig is, one of, is a power user, and he's going to show you some of the great stuff he does with students. Okay, I'm going to drop this. No, that's fine. All right. Yep. Okay, so I'm an eighth grade social studies teacher, so uh, working with eighth graders all week. I'm going to try to keep my weekend brain at bay a little bit <laughs> and uh, keep an instructional uh, engagement going here. So let me just get this plugged in. with Craig has been really awesome for <clears throat> I think both of us that we're able to go back and forth and test ideas out all right so let me start with just this um, my name is intro. Craig Robley I teach seventh and eighth grade social studies at Heritage East Town Magnet School in West St. Paul Minnesota I'm just gonna reload it here sorry for some reason the video didn't play here we go My name is Craig Robley. I teach seventh and eighth grade social studies at Heritage East Town Magnet School in West St. Paul, Minnesota. I got into teaching because 
I like stories. I really love American history. And I want my students to make connections between our history and their own lives because they are a part of that story. iPad has enabled us to focus on those connections. I'm always on the lookout for text and artifacts and resources and websites that I think are gonna be relevant to my students. The problem for us before iPad was access. We just don't have those types of archived documents or visual artifacts. We worked around that by making paper copies of things, but that wasn't the engagement level that we see with iPad. Using iBooks Author to create a book for my students really gave us the tool that we needed to take those materials that existed in paper copies and now put them onto iPad so that they were immediately accessible and engaging for students to interact with. iBooks Author for me is really exciting to use because of all of the potential. When I open up an iBooks Author file, not only can I drag in text so that I'm telling the story through words, but the widgets themselves are a great resource and a tool for me to take my social studies perspective and leverage that into the book. An example would be the Gettysburg Address. Using iBooks Author, I can collect some artifacts to be included in a particular chapter. I've got the picture of President Lincoln leaving the platform after giving a speech. Students are able to take a look at what happened that day and experience it in a way that really comes to life. They can take the popover on an image and dig deeper into the content that they see in that historical photograph or artifact, things that otherwise the students wouldn't have access to. The biggest change that I've seen in my classroom since starting to use iPad is the fact that my students are performing better. They turn in more work. They are more interested in going deeper into topics. The books on iPad that I've created with iBooks Author simply meet their expectations for how they should be learning. The students understand this is their opportunity to look at the stories in a way that is personal for them. And with an individual an iPad in their hand, that's a connection that really resonates. My goal is to continue to emphasize those connections. I really think that's where the heart and soul of it all is. They're learning about people and places, but they're also learning about themselves. Okay, so that shows a little bit of the work that um, I do. I guess I, got, I learned a new term today. I'm a digital remixer, so uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I have to add that to a string of, I don't know, maybe not as always flattering uh, adjectives, but uh, I like that one. So I'm going to use the um, Wars uh, one, and, 1, 2, and Cold book up there that I created for my students last year and uh, use that to show a couple of the ways uh, that I use uh, digital primary sources. Um, first of all, working with Shauna and the Minnesota Historical Society uh, has been really rewarding for me, just in my professional growth, having a connection to a museum uh, as a classroom teacher. Uh, but then also, uh, it's been something where my students are able to um, really benefit from that connection. So from a classroom perspective, uh, I think that uh, um, my experience is you know, mostly connected to the ability to be able to have resources that otherwise my students wouldn't get it, uh, a hold of. So uh, with the uh, first example, uh, one of the other things is uh, that uh, for so many students, um, their ability to um, make local connections is a first line of engagement. So uh, the, this first section of the book, uh, I was able to uh, use the type of source that uh, resonates probably the easiest with students, and that is to have them uh, be able to look at something. Uh, really, when I'm picking primary sources for use in the classroom, I have three things that I'm trying to do. I want to be able to have something that students look at, they read, and they listen to. And so if they can do those three things, uh, not necessarily with the same source, but if they can do those things, uh, that gives them the ability to be engaged and interact. Uh, and so uh, with the uh, World War I example, uh, we used how Minnesota contributed uh, through some farming or agricultural changes uh, to uh, winning the war. And uh, one of the ways that uh, we were able to show that uh, was through uh, some of the uh, posters that were uh, created to encourage Americans uh, to participate this way, and certainly these uh, appeared in uh, Minnesota as well. Um, 
along those lines. Then as an extension for this, my students created their own World War I food poster. So uh, not only could they take a look at an existing primary source, uh, digital primary source, but then they had the ability to go through and say, all right, how do I you know, create something uh, that is similar to that? Um, with, oh, here we go, uh, with World War II, um, we looked at a story that would be, uh, I thought, of interest to the students, and that was, how did this war impact Minnesotans at home? And so for that example, uh, as we went through, I was looking for something that the students would be able to read, and uh, came across uh, um, part of a, a column that was in the um, Laverne, Minnesota newspaper uh, telling about a soldier coming home from the war. Uh, so students were able to take a look at that. You might notice that there's a, a bullseye up in the corner of the digital primary source. Uh, for me, that's my ability to insert learning targets so that I can connect the primary source right to what students are supposed to learn so that as they're looking at it, they can click on that and say, now, why am I looking at this? Oh, yeah, that's the learning target. I'm supposed to try to figure out what a local impact is uh, for World War II. Along those same lines, uh, I can use the uh, info button to connect them to another source so that the digital primary source or the context of that source um, shows a connection uh, or they can segue uh, over to something else. Um, a third way with this is, I'll just go to the table of contents view, make it a little bit easier. Um, Taking a bigger event, something that was beyond uh, Minnesota's borders, so in this case, uh, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, and showing a Minnesota connection through audio. So here is an interview uh, done with us. Susan Eklund's father, Erwin Hench, from Burnsville, didn't talk much about his horrifying experience. You know, up until I was probably in my early 20s, I really didn't hear much about it. On July 30th, 1945, his ship, the USS Indianapolis was hit by two torpedoes from a Japanese submarine. Almost 1,200 men were on board. 900 made it into the water, and over a five-day period, sharks attacked and killed nearly 600. Hench told his daughter they survived by sticking together and splashing and yelling at approaching sharks. I just remember him saying that they took life jackets off of people who had died. Eklund says the experience changed her father's outlook on life and made him thankful for each day he lived thereafter. Edgar Linares, WCCO. And so for students, I know that sometimes from museums or, or in, a, in an archived or curated collection, there may not be as much audio, uh, but that's also a, a really powerful connection for students if they can kind of listen to um, either a person's perspective or some kind of connection. So the, the main thing through all of this is to make sure that um, when I'm using primary sources or digital primary sources in the classroom, that they're within the context of a story. And so then uh, all of these seem to work well for that. Shawna, do we have other things we want to include? Um, or questions, I guess? I'm good. If that's, is that okay? Okay. Insight, observation. Uh, question. So clearly you are a power user teacher. Um, what is the proportion, do you think, of, of teachers like you and teachers kind of at the other end of the spectrum? Um, I, I, what do you think from what you have seen? I mean, I, I can only speak to, the, you know, teachers who I've worked with and I tend to work with a lot of teachers who are like myself. So that um, that's a little bit of a skew, I suppose, for my perspective on it. I think even your observation of teachers in your school, though, you've mm -hmm. talked about that. Mm -hmm. um. I, th I think the hardest thing is um, the awareness of just what is out there. Um, when, when I'm looking at getting started uh, with a story, uh, putting a book together, something like that, I usually start with, from the perspective of a content expert, meaning what am I reading, uh, what do I already know, what connections do I have, um, then it's what do my students need and how do I put that together for them. I think for a lot of my colleagues, they don't necessarily start with I'm a content expert, so what's next? 
<laughs> no, not really. I mean, I that that Pew study I had in 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 my slides, I, I think you know does break down some of that data by um, subject. I think. If I remember correctly, I think science teachers skew a bit higher on kind of the maker um, s spot, and I think social studies teachers skew a bit higher on kind of the blogging, kind of writing kind of area. Um, but anyway. Question. Yeah. Yes, interesting. I was wondering if you have done, tried students to do uh, such books and do their research? Yes, um, we have students using uh, both iBooks Author for creating um, like projects. Uh, they also use iTunes U to do that so that they, in the materials list, can actually curate a bunch of resources themselves. Uh, that seems to resonate really well with them as opposed to you know putting you know, a whole book together. Is there uh, other teachers that are using these books you're making? Yes, it's a, a growing uh, group of uh, educators who are doing more and more of this. Uh, there's also a, an uh, IBA or an iBook author uh, collaboration site online, uh, and um, certainly in the iBook store or right, through iTunes. Um, there are lots of examples that are coming out all the time. Great. Well, I just, uh, anybody else? Um, so feel free to come up and talk to these guys. Um, I also want to say really quick before, while well, I have a captive audience of educators, um, we have a new special interest group this year. Um, they are groups of uh, like-minded colleagues and there are about eight of them for, through MCN. And we launched uh, education and interpretive media um, this year. So I hope all of you will come up and grab a card or else look on the website. Join, um, there's a new, uh, uh, mandate, mission, excitement in MCN <laughs> to utilize SIGs for your benefit. So we hope that you'll take advantage um, of a way to greet colleagues who are like-minded to you. So one more round of applause for our wonderful panelists. Thank you.